narrative into existence. He then has the story written down in the book and is lived out by the creation he made year by year towards the ultimate fulfillment. He says, Elohim, the Almighty, did not create a story that fails in the end. No. His plan is perfect. And he has allowed people the choice to follow the plan or even to be imperfect if they so choose. And that choice gives the story its even plot. So gracious God, we pray according to your will, from your book, from the portion of the story that explains the annual Passover through your servant Moshe, that you be kept, that you be kept eternally. For Moshe said unto the people, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand, Jehovah brought you out from this place. There shall then be no unleavened bread eaten. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that Jehovah's Torah may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath Jehovah brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. We do so in Yeshua. Amen. Wow. One is, all of us know that this Hebraic faith is a verb, or it's a verb faith, it's an action faith. And so we're going to participate in the story of the uh, Pesach, of the Passover, of the Exodus this morning. Um, there will be some, I think, some cool moving parts, but the hope in that is that by touching it, feeling it, much like because Pesach, or Passover, is not a, it's not a day, it's a meal, right? And so, we're going to be able to have opportunity to, um, to share in the story. And one of the wonderful uh, aspects of story that all of us love is in song. So... Um, a song that so beautifully tells the story of the Exodus, I Will Redeem. Um, we're going to sing now. You're welcome to stand if you'd like to read the song. Um,
Egypt, I will free you from your bonds. I will take you as my people. Wait a minute. Isn't this Passover thing? Isn't this Jewish? Isn't that what Jewish people do? It's, it's, yeah, it's like, but, it's, 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 you know, that's Jewish. Is it? Is it Jewish? Who came out of Egypt? This multitude. You guys read the script. <laughs> somebody did the homework and read it for me. But somebody please read Exodus 12, 37 through 38. And read it from the board. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Pekah, and about 600,000 on foot that were men, besides children. And a mixed multitude went up and also with them, and flocks and herds, and even very much. Yeah. Mm. Kind of interesting that they, they journeyed three days, probably three days and three nights, going from there to Sukkot, right? Sukkot. So we see this. But clearly, besides the children of Israel, which somebody already beautifully said, there was also this mixed multitude. The mixed multitude there being um, Iraq, Arab. But this, this was a mixed people. It was not just it was not just the children that had gone into Israel and came out. See, what happens when people are saying that is that we tend to focus on the people. But who's the one that leads Pesach? Is it about the people? Or, or is it about the God? The Elohim? The Almighty? Because there are a bunch of scriptures in the Old Testament that even the Jewish people read, and when they read it, it's leading to something. It leads to a Savior. Look at these verses. I have waited for thy salvation, O Adonai, from Bereshit, or Genesis 49. Here in the Exodus story, and Moshe said to the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of Adonai which he will show um, to you today. For the Egyptians whom you've seen today, you shall see them no more. Isn't that amazing? And many of us are aware of this, that when we see that word in the English, salvation, in the Hebrew, it is the word... What's that? Yeshua. Yeshua, right? Isn't that beautiful? The beautiful name, the name of a home. There's no salvation under of any other name than at the name of Yeshua. So when anyone is reading the Tanakh or what's called oftentimes the Old Testament, any kind of reading words like save, salvation, these words, uh, and other ones, it, it talks about um, God's deliverance or his salvation. Look in the Psalms. Salvation belongs to whom? Adonai. Belongs to the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Anyone feeling blessed today? Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. And even in the New Approved Testament there. <laughs> and you shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua. Yeshua. Salvation. Actually, Yehovah, or um, Yehovah saves, right? We know that. And he what's, because what's he going to do? He's going to be born, Isaiah 9, 6, unto us. Son of Him was born, and here in the fulfillment of it, when our Savior was born, and He shall, Yeshua, His people, He shall save the people from their sins. Anyone excited about salvation from sin in Yeshua? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. That was a hearty hallelujah right there. Yeah. <laughs> There's the beautiful uh, name of Yeshua in Hebrew. What an amazing, what an amazing story our Father has in this season. Because it's not, Passover is not for the Jewish people. It's not for the Christian people. It's for Elohim's people. It's for God's people. And so that means it's, the focus really is upon our Heavenly Father, and He's just absolutely so wonderful. Would somebody please read this verse 
out of Exodus 13, 8 and 9, please. And thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign to thee upon thy hand, and for a memorial between thy eyes, that Jehovah's Torah may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath Jehovah brought thee out of Egypt. With a strong right hand. And where did our Savior go right after he ascended? To the right hand, to of, the the right hand of the Father. So this scripture is really powerful, and we, we, we essentially pray this when we pray the Shema. But Father wants to write his name upon his children. In fact, we're going to get a white stone. We won't get a white stone today, but you'll get something white on it here. The Father wants to claim us as his. He has claimed us on his own. And that's what the Passover story is, is that God has done the work. And so people will often say to us, well, you're keeping those feasts to get saved. There's nothing any person can do at all. All of our works, all of our efforts, if we put all of our works and our efforts together, all of them together from the whole of our life, would not even satisfy the least part of his salvation. Father has so graced us, he so loves us, that not only has he made a way, an opportunity, but then he calls us and he invites us. And we were invited here today, and it's so beautiful to see willing hearts that have come to worship, that love Jehovah. And this, uh, the word here for sign is oath in the Hebrew. It's a mark. This is really interesting because there's a whole lot of people fixated on a mark these days. But the fixation is not on Jehovah's mark. The fixation is on Satan's mark. But the children of God are to be marked by him, by his name. His name, which he revealed in Hebrew, uh, excuse me, in Shemot or Exodus 3 to Moshe. And then we're going to see here as it, as it goes on in the story. But we have a beautiful opportunity. If you would like to, if you are a person that calls upon the name of the Lord or wants to, we have the name of the Father, this Yohe Bahe. And um, Ryan and Shane, would you please come here? We're going to have these two men come by. And if you would like the name of the Father that you can have placed on your hand, we're not doing permanent. But this is a beautiful opportunity. In fact, I was kind of chuckling because churches have altar calls at the end of the service where the minister will say, now bow your head and close your eyes so that nobody can see you. But father's children are excited to be in, their, in his kingdom. Our father's excited about us, and we want to be equally excited about him. So as Ryan and Kenny come by, if you would like the father's name, and you can, you can put it on your hand, or you can put it here on, on your person, it actually, this is on the hand or the forehead, and that's where the other mark will go too, right? For those that don't follow Jehovah, because choose this day who you'll serve. And so if you would like the name of Jehovah, and, there, and we'll extend this out, this is not the last portion of this, but it's certainly, and if I accepting it, it's that I have the name of Jehovah written on my heart. Heavenly Father, it's by grace we're saved through faith. It's a, it's a, it is our belief that we believe that what you've done, we trust. We trust your work. We trust your promises. We trust that what you said you'll do, you will do. And Father, as part of that trust relationship, you write your name upon it, or you place your mark on us, on our hand. And so, Father, as these gentlemen go around to the, the family, we just want to have your name on our heart and in our eyes on all the days of our life in Israel. Amen. All right. And they will come.
captivity? Has anyone ever felt the bondage and the sin and the strain and the stress of Egypt? Has anyone ever mourned, experienced loneliness, even a sense of exile? Passover's Father's plan draws out of Mitzrayim, out of, out of Egypt, you know, toward his glorious light. Hallelujah. Such a beautiful song. So skillfully and beautifully played. Can someone please read the Shemot or Exodus 5, 1 through 3? And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is Jehovah, that I should obey his voice? Let Israel go. I know not Jehovah, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence. With the sword. Thank you, Candy. Let my people go. The great refrain of this story. Let my people go. Do what? Okay, because people on their own have a weird tendency to do things like golden calves and go their own way. Or as it says in Judges, everyone went to their own home and did what was right in their own eyes. So just going. Not necessarily the answer, is it? We have to go with purpose. We have to go with direction. And so the two witnesses, Moshe and Aaron, or Moses and Aaron, they go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. They're speaking for Jehovah, the Elohim of Israel, that we may go hold a chag, a feast, not a modi, but one of the Three festivals, what really the walking festivals that encompass all the that really encompass them all. The hog or the, the, the feasts here, because we're in the spring season, is, is Pesach, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. And they would go up to, we knew that uh, the men and the families would go up to Jerusalem or Jerusalem for this. And then also the next one, which is oak that they would go up, and then what was the third one that they went up? Oh, right, the end gathering at the end, Sukkot, or the Feast of um, Tabernacles. So this is just absolutely fascinating. So Moshe and Aaron go to Pharaoh, and they're saying, we want to go out to keep the feasts. We want to go, God wants us, pardon me, let me strike that God wants us to go out and keep his feasts, the feasts of Jehovah. Okay? But look at this. It says we're supposed to go out there and keep the feast and sacrifice unto Jehovah, lest he fall upon us. Did you see that in the text? If we don't go out and worship, then we will part. Be, we will remain part of its reign. And you can go out and not have the feast in your heart, and you can go out and falsely keep the feasts. They did that later, and they're greatly rebuked by Isaiah and Amos. So just keeping them, if they're not in here, okay, it's not just what happens on Sinai. God always wanted that to come here. But look at this. They're the two witnesses here, Moshe and Aaron, are saying, if we don't go out, the plagues that you're not going to be so crazy about that are coming will fall on us too. And we're coming to a time of plagues in our world. Maybe you could even say they're here. But Yahweh, Jehovah, is calling out a people to worship him. To keep his feast, people that he can write his name upon. Amen. 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 <laughs>
Isn't that cool? Revelation 2.17 says he's going to give us a white stone when we come into glory. So he's going to have a new name written on it. The story of the Exodus stretches as all of God's stories do from the beginning to the end. From the first to the last. From the all of top. Okay? Jehovah's story, you can always know that about anything that's in the Bible. It starts not at the end, but it starts in the beginning. Better sheep. Okay? Look at this very familiar text, actually, that we looked at in the core portion last week. Would somebody please read Better Sheep or Genesis 1, 1 through 3? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, mm. and there was light. Hallelujah. Egypt also was without form and void for God's children. That he heard their cries of bondage and slavery. Just as he has heard our cries of slavery and uh, slavery and bondage in our life when we've been in that place. And after a series of plagues sent into the world for the purpose of letting God's people go to keep the ox of the feast, there were two final plagues that turned evil Pharaoh's heart. These ones really got him. They saw not one another because the darkness was so palpable. You ever been in that place where you can just feel the darkness? Like it, it, it feels like it literally pushes in on your body. There was that was what was happening in Egypt for three days. And we're not going through all the ten plagues this morning. In fact, I think there's a game for the youth that's um, that's uh, focused on those. Um, and we make, I don't say this like we make fun of them, and it's fun because one of the things about this is it's great to participate in the story because then it feels real, doesn't it? But these two, and we've all been in that place. In fact, we've got, we've, we've, I think every single one of us at some time in our life have gone into that room and you had that nervous feeling because it was so dark and you're looking, right? And you flip that light. And all of a sudden, it's like, that which is scary is gone that quickly. And that's what happens here. They, they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. They didn't even move. It was so dark and scary. But all the children of Israel had lights in their dwelling. <laughs> So on the table, there are lights. Let's turn those on. Isn't it appropriate that those that bear the name of the Father have the light from the Father of all lights? whom there is no shadow, no turning. He calls us then to not be double-minded. What's that? Okay. Wow. There was intense darkness throughout the whole place, except in the dwellings of God's people. But there was a bigger problem, actually, than that. And if we look at that Genesis text, it's a problem that eclipses all humanity. It's part of the story that we're looking at. It's God's story. Because God made man, Elohim made man to be lights in this world, to reflect his glory. But Adam, or Adam, his firstborn, fell because of the darkness of disobedience that was found in his heart. 
his fall brought not just Mitzrayim, not just Babylon, not just Rome, not just Greece. His fall brought death into the entire world. And he was kicked out of the paradise that God had made for him, and he was cast out into the wilderness. And Israel would go into the wilderness towards the light of Torah. The redemption is ultimately, but, excuse me, but redemption is ultimately in the light of the world. We saw Yeshua deal with this dynamic of darkness. When he came to a man, let's look at this story. There was an Adam. That's what man is, right? He's an Adam, a man, uh, an Adam. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a roach or a head, a first of uh, the Jewish of the Jews of Yehuda. This man came to Yeshua by what? Okay, was he walking in the light? Doesn't appear at this point. And he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, and that no one can do these signs unless God is with him. So there's a confession of faith. Yeshua answered, and truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, or anew, or from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Period. End of story. We have to be born of God. Can't be born of Adam. We all are born of Adam. But we need to be reborn for God and his plan and his will. Darkness was part of the narrative that our Messiah overcame. Isn't that amazing? There was darkness for three days and three nights. Can you imagine after the first 24 hours, if you think this is ever going to end? And for some people, darkness has felt like it was never going to end. They could not get out of that dark place. And from the sixth hour, while our Savior was on the death stage, from the sixth hour, there was a darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, or three hours. Eclipsing the three days, our Savior paid the price on the cross, on the tree, at Calvary, for us. Somebody please read this next powerful text from Kepha, or 1 Peter. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a royal nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. A holy nation. Exactly what he was calling a peculiar people. A, a chosen people that he, would, that he calls out of the terrain. He calls everyone to come out. And not everyone wants to come out. Even some people, when they come out of the city, turn back because their heart's still there. And they end up with a iodine problem. But look at this. Father has called his people that have his name into the light, out of the darkness of Mitzrayim, and into the glorious light of his kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And once he does that, it doesn't stop there. It's not good enough that there's just light in our house, because that's selfish. He doesn't make us a light so we can burn each other with our lights in the house. He wants our light to radiate on and off each other. But look at Isaiah 49, 6. This is the heart of the Father. Once you have left the darkness of Mizraim and come into his glorious light of Torah, he says, shall it be a small matter for you to be my servant? To raise up the tribes of Yoko and to bring back the preserved ones of Israel, and I shall give you as a light to the going, the nations, to be my Yeshua to the ends of the earth. You're saying we're Yeshua? He's the head, we're his body. He's the light, he sets us as light. We're not the light. We have his light. 
in us through the rock, HaKadosh. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that wonderful? Aren't you grateful and thankful this day? Pharaoh had been throwing God's babies into the Nile for years to steal, kill, and destroy God's people. The enemy has been doing that here at least for the last 50 years that we know in our own nation, of which we should all be incredibly grieved. And it fits this season because that's the nature of Pharaoh. That's the nature of the kingdom of man. They throw babies into Niles. They, in the, in the stomach of Moloch, in the, in the belly of Moloch, they're not safe. Because Pharaoh is a beast of death. So Elohim appointed a destroyer angel of death to pass over the people of the land. If their doorpost was not covered by the blood of the lamb, the firstborn of the house would die, just as Adam's sin resulted in death, in the death of his son. Let me please read Exodus here, 4, 22 and 23. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, Let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will go to your son, your firstborn. If you're a firstborn in your family, from your homes, I want you to stand up right now. Now, if you have the name of Jehovah on you, please take it off and put it down on the table. This is how serious the gospel of Messiah is. This is how serious what we do is. This is how serious our faith is. If we are not lights, if we do not have love in our hearts to reach out from our home and to fulfill the plan of God by not only living for him, coming out of the train, coming out of Egypt, and following in his ways, if we are not faithful, these people will die. What is, it's at least 10% of us, right? At least, or more? Okay, first born, you may sit down. But thankfully for us, we know the end of the story. For all of God's people, they know the end of the story because God's faithful promise are yea and amen. And it is not, God is not willing that any firstborn would perish. God is willing that not any secondborn would perish. God is not willing that any of the twelve sons would perish. Somebody please read Exodus 12, 12 for us. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute power. I am Yahweh. Wow. Who's the Hebrew here? I will Avar. I will pass over. That's what Hebrew means. The one that passes over, the one that crosses over. Who is it here that says he will? Passover, a crossover? <laughs> it is Yehovah. It is Yehovah. Because our God so loves this cosmos, He so loves this world, He gave His only begotten Son. And earlier, we professed faith and belief. Thank you, Ryan. We, we professed faith and belief by receiving the name of Jehovah upon us. And by doing that action of faith and belief is not just a mental ascent. It's a, it's a whole 
life aspect of us. For Elohim so loved the cosmos, the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not remain in, the, in this rain, will not perish, will not perish in the waters, but have eternal life. And from Yeshua HaMashiach, Yochanan or John writes in the Revelation, from Yeshua HaMashiach, who is a faithful martyr, word for witness, Hatteros, martyr, Yeshua is the faithful martyr who gave his life up there, John 3.16, and he's the firstborn, the firstborn, the first begotten, and I love how Rotherham puts it, out from among the dead. Firstborns, could you please stand back up? Because of you, because of faith in Yeshua Hamashiach, who saves us all, but especially on this night, from the death angel that passes over Mitzrayim, you may put the name of God back on. Because of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Does God want part of the house saved or the whole house? Oh, wow. You can be seated. Jesus, Lord. 
not a synagogue service, for the home. And they would take the lamb into the home. And for those people who have beloved animals that you even allow in your home or in your life, you know how precious they are. Speak to all the congregations of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of Nisan, each one of them is to take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for each household. Four days before our Pesach gathering, we headed out to the Cavanus' farm to experience the impact of seeing lambs as they would have been at the time of Messiah Yeshua. Willie and Kayleen opened their sheep pen and home, allowing us the opportunity to pet and feed the sheep and also see a ram that would have been about the same age as the one that would have been taken into the home prior to Passover. It's one thing to read in Exodus 12:5, let the lamb be a perfect one, a year old male, or verse 6, and you shall keep it from the 10th until the 14th day of the same month, or the process of Exodus 12:46, it is eaten in one house, you are not to take any of the flesh outside the house, nor are you to break out any bone of it. But it's another thing being in contact with a precious animal that God made and loves. Reading the biblical text and petting the lamb likened them to the one that would have been taken into the home and then be the sacrificed animal for your Passover was vivid and emotional. Then to think ultimately it wasn't any lamb that was slaughtered, but the perfect lamb of God. For ours is no high priest who is incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses, but one who's been tempted in every respect like ourselves, yet without sinning. The nearness of Yeshua in the lambs is set against sacrifice for our dividing and grotesque sins. And you know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Like, you gotta go into the examination of the lamb. So, whenever they would bring the lamb in, and they would examine it. For three days, they would examine the lamb. And so they would look for any spot or blemish to make sure that it didn't have a little cough, it didn't have a nose, it didn't have an ear that was missing a piece, the tail wasn't missing, um, you know, that its legs were straight, uh, that it, it wasn't dirty. This lamb could not be dirty. It could not have rolled around in the mud. So they would lay it on the lamb, and they would look for any spot or blemish to make sure that it didn't have a little cough, it didn't have a little nose, it didn't have an ear that was missing a piece, the tail wasn't missing, it wasn't dirty. This lamb could not be dirty. It could not have rolled around in the mud. So they would lay it on the lamb, and they would examine it, and they would say, okay, this is what's missing. It's humbling knowing the sinless Yeshua died for our sins. He was our Passover lamb. The writer of Acts quotes Isaiah 53 saying, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shears, so he opened not his mouth. You know, the innocent bleeping of the sheep out on the farm had that ominous sense that it was born just for such a thing. The lamb was taken into the home four days before Pesach to be examined for any defects or disease, any imperfections that would disqualify it as the Pesach lamb. This is exactly what happened to Yeshua as he entered Jerusalem just before his death and was examined by the religious leaders as recorded in Matthew's chapter 21 through 23. Matthew 21, 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage, Beth Page means house of figs. They were walking past the same type of tree that fell at them. And unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Yeshua two disciples or two witnesses. Matthew 21, 23. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? Yeshua is being examined. Religion looks for a defect. Matthew 21, 24, Yeshua answered them, I will ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things, the baptism of John. Where does it come from, from heaven or from man? And they discussed it amongst themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say of us, Why then didn't you believe him? Yeshua's inspection by religion revealed a deficit, all right, that of the religious system of man that knows not God. Author Robert Mock writes, According to the Mosaic instruction on the observance of the Passover, the lamb was to be inspected by the high priest and the Kohanim for four days before the Passover slain of the lamb. For four days, Yeshua was also inspected, interrogated, accosted, intimidated, and challenged by the Pharisees, scribes, and lawyers. Yeah. I cry every time I have to do it. Yeah. 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 It's very hard. <laughs> Next is...
bread inside. All right, kids, let's let them line up once again. The father rolled our day perfectly together. We had planned on unleavened bread being on another day, but it got moved to the same day as the sheep. The sinless lamb born in Bethlehem, house of bread, and the leavenless savior who told his disciples, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the lamb of God, the Passover lamb, the bread of life, the unleavened manna from above, Yeshua. What did you like, son? I like, I like playing with these guys. Aren't these guys awesome? <laughs> hey, how about you? Well, how was this for you? It was busy. It was very busy. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, no, it's, for your it's really, it's really, uh, it's really a blessing. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a blessing to do something like this. We do things that will uh, reflect. Like, uh, what Jesus did for us mm -hmm. and, and the things in our lives. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by The Exodus story is that in the first month of the year, on the tenth day, the lamb was examined, as we've seen, for the three days, brought out of the house on the fourteenth, and slaughtered and cooked in the evening. Every father of the house, um, there was supposed to be enough lamb for the whole household. If somebody didn't have enough, they could join another family. And that helps us understand a little bit of this verse. Would somebody please read this verse from the Gospel of John? Now there stood by the cross of Yeshua his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of 
Cleopa and Mary Magdalene. When the two were of their four and saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. <coughs> then saith he to his disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciples took her unto his own home. Huh. Just before his death, Yeshua putting his home in order as he would go off to glory to be the one putting the spiritual house of the Father in order. That even in this, the lamb that was being slain made sure that his not only his mother was taken care of, amen, fulfilling, continuing the, the fulfillment of the fourth command, but also making sure that his mother, her Pesach, would have a home to be in. As we turn now to look, and again, we're looking at the Pesach meal. This is a memorial. This is what we're working towards in his glorious kingdom. And we'll see that in just a second. But this is a really powerful time for the home. As I said, Pesach is a family event. And one of the things that would happen would be they would take hyssop and they would dip it in after the, the lamb was slain. And they would uh, go to the doorpost. Door and covenant is covenant in God's plan. So when you go through a door, that's why the, uh, the Zeus is on the door with the commands. When you go across the doorpost, you're going, you're coming into covenant. Okay. And the blood was placed on the doorpost so that the angel of death, the destroyer, would pass over. And we have a beautiful example of that over the door here with the, the linen. But what we're going to do now, and this will take a, a little bit, but this branch is going to pass to each man. And I'd like, that I'd like the man, of, and if you don't have a home, uh, excuse me, if you're, if you're single or um, whatever may be the case, as this man, men, as this uh, branch comes to you, this is an opportunity for you to pray for your home. This is an opportunity for you to pray over your home and your family. And if you can just, as it comes to you, you can thank the Father and pass it to the next man and then you can say the prayer just for the sake of time. But this is because, and we saw this with the jailer in Acts 16 that was scared. Uh, when, when, the, when the doors were open, and then he prayed for his whole home, right? Pesach is a family event, and, and fathers, husbands, man of the home, when this branch comes to you, just thank God, and then you can pass it to the next man, but then take a moment, stay either standing or seated after you pass the branch to the next gentleman, and pray for your family. about it's a good discussion about what was the meal that you sure partook of I've read hours and hours on that whether it was you partook of a memorial beforehand or the actual Pesach meal um, it was definitely a, a point of uh, interesting midrash that we can pick up at another time um, what we're doing here today is in the Pesach meal as according to uh, scripture. Uh, we will uh, have some prayer 
Spirit. So Yeshua, obviously, in, in all things, modeled um, this powerful meal that was to be kept, not just once, not by one group of people, but everybody, for, by everyone for all time, by every home. And what a, what a gift and what a treasure it is to be able to pray over your families and over your home, isn't it? Uh, and hopefully that is something that we do faithfully every day. In Luke 22, and when the hour was come, very specific, not capricious, not haphazard. Father orders times and seasons very down to the very minute. No matter what happens in our life, we need to remember that. And that's why it's important to keep in his calendar. And that's challenging. When the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him and said to them, with desire, I have um, excuse me, with desire, desire to eat this taste of the Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of his Father, our Father. And he took the cup and gave thanks. And do we have the cups filled? We do not. We do not. We were going to do that while the men were praying. I forgot that piece, and I'm very sorry. So I'll just explain it because we're in our neighbor's house, if you will, and we're very grateful for that. The, a great idea was hatched to be able to fill because we're going to um, use the cups twice so you'll be able to do um, and this is a juice so we'll be, we're trying to be care careful of spillage obviously and so if you would fill the cups and something really awesome about these cups. These cups are uh, basically from Bethlehem. And so when you when you go, uh, you will, there's a couple things that you can take there. And one of these is a, a beautiful gift of the Haaretz, the lamb. That this is wood from the lamb. And so as you go today, you will be able to, because that's when you leave Mitzrayim, when you leave Egypt, Again, there's nothing capricious in God's plan. He has a promised land for us to go to. A land, he, we go from that, we go from a land that is dark, we go from a land that is void and fruitless to a land of promise that is full of fruit. We would even say the fruit of the rock and the fruit of the spirit. So as you go today, please make sure you take that and put that in a Beautiful promise placed in your home because the, the promise of the land, the land promise of the Father, is still every bit as real part of our salvation and it's upcoming really soon. And He is going to cleanse this earth so that it will be set apart, and beautiful, and amazing. If I could have a gentleman comfortable with um, the prayer of the cup, would you mind standing and reading? In fact, let's all stand for the blessing.
important part of remembering the, this whole story because we do not want Egypt to taste good to us. Right. Egypt should be like, uh, can I get something to dip this in? No, this is Egypt. Okay, it's bitter. We, uh, we had real bitter last night. It was beautiful. But this is a, an example of the bitter herb. So go ahead. They had to leave in haste. And this is such a profound and such a powerful meal because it all of it points to the death, burial, death, Egypt, burial, unleavened bread. It goes into the it goes into the oven, but it doesn't rise. It doesn't have the sin factor in it. It does not have a leavening agent that causes it like Satan to rise and pride. Anger and disgust. And Tuesday night we'll share in uh, first fruits together. But uh, it was quite a process. Not only having the lamb, but then also slaughtering it, and then it became part of the meal. And everything that happened around the cross was all part of this, because our Passover, our Passover lamb. Back in the book of Revelation, 20, it is the prominent name of Yeshua in the book of Revelation. 29 times he's called the Lamb more than any other thing. He's the Son of God, Son of Man, any other title or name of him is the most prominent, his Lamb. It's a taste like the book in the book of Revelation. And the greater exodus that's coming. It's a powerful, profound story that this meal describes it all. And so in we're familiar with that text in John 6. In fact, that's where they were trying to seize him to become king, the zealots. They said, wow, this guy can multiply, this guy can multiply bread. He'd make a great king. Let's, let's grab him and make him our king. And he said to them, you want to eat bread? He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part with me. And it says they all left. We want nothing to do with this guy. They didn't understand what he was saying. And he turns to his disciples, and you would think at that point we would want to rally the troops, right? And say, hey guys, you know, everybody left. We gotta hope stay together. And he turned to them and he said, I chose you. Are you gonna leave? I chose you. And what do you have the devil? And so this meal is about partaking of the Lord, not one time. But Continually remembering. And remembering. And so take a piece in, uh, of lamb and unleavened bread. You can make a little sandwich. This is not the meal. We have a meal upcoming with shepherd's pie. <laughs> but this is this is that beautiful sense of being able to partake. And it points to Continuing. In fact, it says in Psalm 34, I, I believe 34 7, it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good.
right here, does anybody, when you think of Yeshua, does it come to your mind that Yeshua was a very skillful singer? Do you know that Yeshua loved to sing? And it actually says in the scriptures, he sings over and God sing, and sings over us. But Yeshua loved to sing. He probably played an instrument because just because just like David did. You said we don't have record of that. You're right. Actually, John says that, that if everything was written about Yeshua that needed to be written, the world could not contain the books. But they went out singing a hymn, and they went out and sang the Hillel songs from the Psalms. And it's really interesting because in that in that portion of Scripture is that verse in there, Psalm 116, precious in the sight of Jehovah is the death of his saints. As he started going into the Garden of Gethsemane, before he would be praying and saying, it's not my will. If I if I had a choice, I wouldn't go this way. And I think most all of us are like that. Are sometimes faith choices difficult? Are they always easy? Or sometimes do we come to those places where we know it's God's will, and even though it doesn't feel good to our flesh or ourselves, we say, I would, or sometimes it's not even that. It's just there seems like two options. If you know one is the Lord's and one what I would like to do, and you say, I'd like to do this. Nevertheless, it's not what I'm choosing. It's not my will. It's not the way that I want to go. I want to go your way. I want to fulfill your will. And I just want us to acknowledge that, that not all decisions are easy decisions. And Yeshua sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane was such a difficult decision to do everything that we're talking about in this story for us. Remember when the firstborn stood up? This is an amazing thing that our Savior has done for us. You're welcome to stand as we sing this powerful song.
Stirring in my heart, there has to be more. I'll have my scribe Shaphan go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may count the money that has been brought to the house of Jehovah, where the keepers of the threshold have collected the people. And, it let, and let it be given to the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of Jehovah, and let them give it to the workmen who are at the house of Jehovah. To carry the I, Shaphan, the scribe, went to the high priest, Hilkiah, to deliver Josiah's charge. After years of working on the temple, Hilkiah, the high priest, says, Scribe Shaphan, I have found the book of the law in the house of Jehovah. <laughs> Take it to King Josiah. Shaphan, the scribe, goes to Josiah. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that Jehovah did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders. Yet Jehovah has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. And I have led you forty years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine, nor similar drink, that you may know that I am Jehovah your Elohim, and when you came to this place, Zephon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, came out against us to battle and conquered them. We took their land, and I gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, to the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them, that you may prosper in all that you do. Josiah tears his clothes and says, I priest Hilkiah, John Sh scribe Shaphan, and you other servants. Go, inquire of Jehovah for me and for the people and for all of Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of Adonai that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book and do according to all that is written concerning us. So Hukaiah the priest, and Ahikam, and Arpor, and Shaphan, and Asaiah went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, son of Haras, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they talked with her. Thus says Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me. Thus says Yahweh, behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants, all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore my wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. But the, to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of Yahweh, thus shall you say to him, 
Thus says Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because you, your heart was penitent, and you humbled yourself before Yahweh, when you heard when you heard how I spoke against his plates and against his inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse. When you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, declares Yahweh. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place. Then the king sent, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of Yahweh, and with him all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the prophets, all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the book of Yahweh. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant with them before Yahweh. To walk after, to walk after Yahweh and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. Amen. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of Yehovah thy God, to observe to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on a high, high above all nations of the earth. And Yehovah shall establish thee and holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep thy commandments of the Lord thy God, and walk in his ways. And thou shalt not go aside from any of these words which I command thee this day, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. But it shall come to pass, if thou shalt look, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of Jehovah thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And the king said. I commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order, and the keepers, for they were perverting the Moabim, using the hill of sun, moon, and stars for their idolatrous ways. So why did you see the Josiah's story in our Pesach? There had been a long period of time from the time of the judges to Josiah. Because that was 2 Kings 23, 22. For no such Passover had been kept since the days of the judges who judged Israel, or during all the days of the kings of Israel, or the kings of Judah. Josiah first, first, round, first found the word of God, and he called everyone to tear down the high places and destroy the paganism in the land. Then he called for the Passover to return to King Jerusalem. Hallelujah. There has been a long period of time since the death of Yeshua until his return. In 1947, the word of God was found in the caves of Qumran. And the next year, Israel was reborn as a nation. Hallelujah. Fifty years later, Jerusalem came into the hands of the nations of Israel, and in 2017, it was recognized as Israel's capital. The capital is where the king reigns from. And here we are, the tribes of the nations, keeping the feast of Yahweh in anticipation of Messiah's Yeshua return. It's truly an amazing time in the plan of God, and we are all participating in God's holy plan of redemption. Amen. Amen.
own religion. It's not mystical and out there and and weird and woo-woo. It's you can sense it. You can articulate like we've been doing. You can touch it and feel it like what John said in 1 John. The eternal life will come through him. We touched him. We felt him. We walked with him. God's word comes alive when it comes alive in us. And that's what Yeshua is saying. And I won't break this again until I'm bringing it with you. And we're going to be in his kingdom someday based on his name. Amen. That's an okay for an amen right there. And so as we take this, this is in remembrance that there's a coming kingdom that Yeshua will reign in as the king. The king of kings and the lord of lords. And as we drink this, let's have a thirst. As the deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts after that day for your kingdom. And oh, Yeshua, come, Yeshua. Let's drink together. Family of God, we have ours. We're enjoying ours together today. Amen. 